try to keep the red stuff. So what we need to know about bleeding, you try to keep the wet red stuff inside, blood goes round and round. Any variation from that is a bad thing, right? The heart goes pump, pump, pump. The blood goes round, round, round. What goes the fox? <laughs> so, I think it's something like ding, 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 something like that. Nobody knows. It's an ancient mystery. Um, what's important about bleeding? Why is bleeding a bad thing? Because blood is your your life force. It is your vehicle for oxygen, and oxygen is your life source, right? So it is the aircraft that's carrying your life force. I don't know. Um, anyways. You start losing blood, you start losing oxygen, right? You start becoming hypoxic. Your body starts going into all kinds of bad non-homeostatic issues, right? I don't even know if that's a word. After trauma, your most common cause of shock is going to be hemorrhage, right? Bleed. Uh, We just had a whole semester on the heart. So I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on that. But let's just review just a minute. Right side takes in what? Deoxygenated blood. Left side does what? So the heart is actually what? Two pumps, right? You got your right sided pump, which is your low pressure pump. Your left sided pump, which is your high pressure pump. The whole point, or not the whole point, but the main job of blood is it is related to oxygen carrying capacity is to provide internal and external respiration, right? Onloading and offloading, right? It's going to pick up CO2, it's going to drop off oxygen. So it's a twofold issue if you start bleeding out. Cells aren't getting oxygen, they're becoming hypoxic. They're also becoming toxic because they're not able to get rid of what? Lactic acid, pyruvic acid, byproducts of metabolism, right? So then the body becomes acidotic. What I just talked about, if the blood stops, cells become engulfed in waste products. Waste products aren't good. Oxygen doesn't arrive to the cells, the cells start doing what? They start going through what type of metabolism? Anaerobic. Anaerobic creates heat and toxic waste products, right? Very little energy. Your circulatory system is supposed to be a open or closed system. Closed. It's supposed to keep the red, wet stuff inside, right Ryan? Yes, it is. Composed of your arteries, your veins, your capillaries, and your arterioles, right? And your venules. Arterioles are your small parts of your arteries. Your venules are your small parts of your veins, right? That's what the, um, that's what the circulatory system looks like if you take the rest of the body parts away. What's the only um, what's the only artery that carries the oxygenated blood? Yeah, pulmonary artery. Except for what other time? The umbilical artery. So, circular, circulatory system, closed system. The problem in trauma is that that closed system becomes Open. 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 Y'all are just going to have to read my mind and know what I'm asking you, okay? We've spent a whole semester together. Y'all are just going to have to perform a little better, I guess. I don't know. Your heart. Size of closed fist, right? What does that have to do with, with trauma? Well, you start running out of blood, your heart gets insulted, 
and starts getting, and when I say insulted, it doesn't mean he gets his feelings hurt. It actually has something systematically happen to it, right? It doesn't get depressed and cut itself. It just gets <laughs> irritated. All right? We just talked about this. Um, so the right side, it pushes blood to the lungs where internal or external respiration occurs. External, external. From the, from the lungs, it's now oxygenated, so it goes back into the left side. The left side, what? Has to go to the body. Ooh, what's that term that the left ventricle has to um, overcome in order to perfuse the body? Y'all learned something, didn't you? I'll take full credit for that. I know, Miss Perry, she did awesome, didn't she? Those four weeks y'all had her, that's where you learned everything, right? Um, so your, your lungs and your heart, they work together to oxygenate the body. That is your cardiopulmonary system. Again, why are we going through a review of these basic anatomical knowledge? Everything goes back to basics. Normal homeostatic balance in the body always goes back to adequate perfusion, right? The cells require two things. Really, they require several more, but the main two things they require is oxygen and glucose, right? I know y'all heard that until you're tired of hearing it in advance, and now you get to hear it again. Requires oxygen and glucose. We're worried about the oxygen when we talk about shock, right? When we have a traumatic injury, not only are we managing that injury, but we're managing the complete cardiopulmonary system. Does that make sense? So a isolated musculoskeletal injury that sliced open an artery is not an isolated musculoskeletal injury, right? We are now we're now involved in the cardiopulmonary system. So you've got to get back to your basics to truly understand what you need to do to treat these injuries. What was preload? All right, so basically, basically, it's the amount of blood that the right ventricle is going to have to work with, right? It's the amount of blood that's coming back to the right side of the heart. What are factors that affect preload? The volume, your pressure, the size of the container, right? All these things are affecting preload, which are all going to be things that affect, that are affected in traumatic injury, right? Starting with volume, you're in hemorrhagic stroke, hemorrhagic shock, you're losing volume, right? As you lose volume, you lose pressure, right? As you lose volume and pressure, you lose preload. If preload's not there, if we don't have enough blood for the right side to work with, what's going to happen to the left side? It's not going to have anything to work with either, right? It's a snowball. It's a snowball effect. <coughs> Thought of that on my own. <laughs> um, afterload. Another term for afterload is that term that Sam uh, so smartingly said earlier. Systemic vascular resistance, right? So depending on what text you look at, you'll hear... Um, I'm the teacher, I can make words up. Um, you'll hear several different terms that are associated with um, afterload. Some texts will say afterload is the amount of blood that's left in the left ventricle at the end of diastole, the end diastolic volume of blood. But basically your afterload is the amount of pressure that you're going to work with and you're going to have to overcome to perfuse the rest of the body. Now, early on back in uh, 241, we talked about the whole purpose of us treating cardiac rhythms 
of cardiac management is to restore what? Cardiac output, right? The whole purpose of us treating a traumatic injury is to restore cardiac output because if we can restore cardiac output, we can restore perfusion to the cells, right? Several things that factor, or several factors that, in, that affect cardiac <coughs> output. Your stroke volume, what's your stroke volume? How much blood is pumped out of the left ventricle in one beat, right? And then your heart rate, how fast or how slow? How is shock going to affect cardiac output? Just think about shock in general. The patho of shock. If it lowers your stroke volume, then it's going to lower your cardiac output. All right. So if we lose volume, we're going to lower preload, so we're going to lower stroke volume, right? We're not going to have as much to come out. All right? So then your heart rate is going to try to go up. All right. So your heart rate is going to go up. So that is a compensatory mechanism that helps keep your blood pressure at a normal level during the early stages of shock. If we can increase the heart rate, then we can increase the stroke volume because we're having more come out, all right? It may not be as full of a squeeze, but we're going to have more squeezes where more blood's going to come out. Then we can improve cardiac output. So why is, why is low blood pressure a sign of late shock? Because you're losing stroke volume, right? You're losing the amount of blood. That's Each pulse beat is stroke volume, right? Each time your heart pulsates, it's pushing blood out. You start losing pressure, that means that your stroke volume is decreasing. All right? And then a very ominous sign of late shock is going to be bradycardia, right? Because now we've lost stroke volume and we've lost all compensatory mechanisms that are involved in trying to maintain the body. Increased venous return results in increased cardiac contractility. Increased preload results in greater stroke volume. Does that make sense? Um, you know, all that that we just talked about right there. Um, the blood, it consists of plasma. Plasma is the what part of blood? The liquid part, right? The part that kind of gets everything rolling. All right? Your formed elements in your plasma are your red, white cells and your platelets. Now, when we're talking about traumatic injuries, which blood cells are going to come into play more? Your red blood cells and your platelets. Your red blood cells for the hemoglobin, right? And then your platelets for what? For your clotting cascades. All right, we've already talked about the purpose of your blood. Your plasma is more than half of your total blood volume. Your erythrocytes are your formed red blood cells. Y'all know that? Y'all learned that in 201. Hemoglobin, that's the protein that's on the red blood cell that binds to oxygen, right? That's where we get our oxygen saturation, our SpO2. SpO2 just looks at the amount of sat or how saturated a hemoglobin molecule is. Now, in trauma, SpO2 is not going to be a very reliable indicator, all right? And it goes back to that example that I used a long time ago. You've got a hemoglobin that has five oxygen cells bound to it, the SpO2 is going to read that as 100% saturated. You've got a hemoglobin that has 10 oxygen molecules bound to it, the SpO2 is going to read that as 100% saturated. All right? All it's looking at is the amount of available oxygen that's in the body. So I may have, you know, very little available oxygen, but all 
the available oxygen that's in the body is bound to the hemoglobin, so it is 100% saturated. Does that make sense? So you have to look at your overall appearance of your patient. Whoa, y'all remember that oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve? I hope y'all do, because I sure do. It uh, represents the relationship between your uh, um, partial pressure of oxygen and your uh, SpO2. Your leukocytes, therefore your inflammatory and immune response, and then your platelets, they're essential for clot formation. All right. Um, don't think we really need to get too deep into this not deep stuff at all. You know what arteries and veins do. Your autonomic nervous system comes into play whenever you, um, whenever the body becomes, well, when it stimulates the sympathetic system, but when it becomes stressed. So in most cases, in a traumatic injury, traumatic situation, your sympathetic nervous system is going to become stressed. What are effects of the sympathetic nervous system? All right, pretty much everything's going to increase, right? It's going to release what catecholamines? You remember? Epi, adrenaline, epinephrine. What does epinephrine do? What do we give epinephrine? What, what are we expecting it to do? Causes vasoconstriction. All right, um, causes bronchodilation, but it also stimulates the heart, speeds the heart up, and it's going to increase blood pressure by causing the vasoconstriction. All right, so that's part of your compensation. Then you've got your parasympathetic nervous system, which is your rest and digest. Your sympathetic is your fight or flight. And then your endocrine system, it, play, it has some effects on your blood pressure too. You've got your, uh, your renin, aldosterone, angiotensin, all those um, hormones that are released. Um, and then you've got antidiuretic hormone. Why do you think antidiuretic hormone would be released during hypovolemic uh, states? Right, right. <laughs> So the body normally diureses itself. That's how you pee, right? Through osmotic diuresis. All right? So you, you pee that way. Your body's going to release this ADH, this antidiuretic hormone, to tell your body, hey, we're getting low on fluids. We need to retain all available fluids. All right? Some of the reasons why whenever you um, start getting into late stages of heat, Exhaustion, heat stroke, you quit sweating, you don't pee, because your volume depleted, but then your body is going to hold on to whatever is left, all right? And all this is going to come into play to help regulate your blood pressure as well. If we can tell the body, hold on to that fluid, then it's going to keep that fluid in circulation. Make sense? So, all forms of shock leads back to what? The words up here on the board? The whole pathologic state of shock is cellular hypoperfusion. Several, um, several aspects of oxygen delivery. You got to have an adequate heart rate, right? Good stroke volume. You got to have good hemoglobin levels. Good hemoglobin levels. Hemoglobin is attached to red blood cells. So you don't need to be anemic, right? And then a good uh, arterial oxygen saturation. Bleeding. What do we do for bleeding? Direct pressure. If direct pressure don't work, more direct pressure, tourniquet, and hemostatic agents, right? That's all you need to know about bleeding, right? We've got to stop it, right? Of course, the book eventually. Yeah, it all eventually stop. Of course, the book thinks you need to know a little bit more. Um, 
An important aspect of bleeding, though, is that we need to identify the potential for internal bleeding in traumatic states because we can manage internal bleeding, right? And as a matter of fact, if we start volume resuscitation, fluid resuscitation, we can actually potentiate internal bleeding or make it worse. What are some of the things that we look for for internal hemorrhage? All right. What is one of the, the most obvious signs of, of hypoperfusion or shock? Think noggin. Alter mental. Alter mental status. All right. So we've got a patient's alter mental status. We don't see any puddles of blood anywhere. We're thinking something's going on. Either they've hit their head or they're bleeding inside. Then I heard several folks say we're looking for abdominal distension, you know, distension, discoloration. We're looking for what were those things called? Bilateral. Bilateral bruising on the flanks. Gray, gray Turner sign. All right. We're looking for bruising around the umbilicus. All right. We're looking for uh, periorbital bilateral ecchymosis, also known as raccoon's eyes. We're looking for battle signs behind the ears. It indicates head bleeding, right? So we're looking for the pathophysiology, the signs and symptoms of shock, and we're also looking for these outward signs. All right? Capillary bleeding, oozing small amounts. It could be bright red. All right? Venous bleeding is going to be oozing dark red. And then arterial bleeding, spurting bright red, right? Which one is harder to control? Arterial, because it's under higher pressure, right? Kind of talked about this right here. So again, we're looking for our signs and symptoms of shock, tachycardia, um, pain and tenderness. You know, the most common places that internal bleeding is going to manifest is going to be in the abdomen, right? In the abdomen and in, in the back. <clears throat> so your body, it can't tolerate no more than about 20% of blood loss. Then you start seeing early signs of shock. How much fluid is in the normal human body? Mm, depending on size, four to five liters. You know, bigger people may have more. Um, but roughly, a good estimate is about five liters of blood. So 20% of that is going to be about a liter of blood, <laughs> a bag of fluid of blood. All right? In the grand scheme of things, that isn't a whole lot, right? You could have a relatively minor injury that could bleed that much rel uh, relatively quickly. All right? Um, and so compensation is going to come into play, but it's going to depend on how quick that patient is bleeding. Then we're going to go back and look at our mechanism of injury and our scene size up. Um, we're going to consider the bleeding to be serious if you know any of the things you see here. And most importantly, it's going to be your signs and symptoms of shock. All right? Um, venous and capillary bleeding is usually going to clot better than arterial bleeding. Why? Low pressure. Low pressure, right. So it gives the platelets time to aggregate and then to start forming that fibrin clot, right? The um, clotting cascade. So usually about 10 minutes bleeding will stop. If the clot don't form, then it's not going to stop, obviously. The open system is going to stay open. Now, what are some factors that go into clotting? Huh? All right. Are they on some type of anticoagulant therapy? Do they take aspirin every day? All right. Even age can fall into that. Also, <coughs> alcohol. person that's pretty drunk, they'll bleed like a stuck hog. All right. If you know what a stuck hog looks like when he bleeds, I don't. 
Also, hemophilia. What's a street term for a hemophiliac? Free bleeder. A free bleeder. A free bleeder. These patients, any injury is potentially serious, all right? With a patient that's on chronic um, anticoagulant therapy, such as the elderly, um, any injury is potentially serious with them, too. Um, shock. Shock always goes back to what? Poor cellular perfusion, hypoperfusion of the cells. No matter what the cause is, the bottom line is the cells ain't getting oxygen, right? Man, it's awesome to have about six of y'all sitting there with your eyes closed while I'm trying to teach. You've got your respiratory failure usually going to be an obstructive type of um, shock. Your pump failure is going to be a result of cardiogenic shock. Then your poor vessel function, that's where you're going to see your distributive shock. All right. What are your distributive shocks? You've got anaphylaxis, neurogenic, right? All that affect the diameter of the vasculature, right? The septic shock is actually going to be a type of hypovolemic shock and a type of distributive shock because in septic shock, the capillaries become permeable and they start leaking fluid into the interstitial space so you become hypovolemic, but then also the vascular system expands. Um, and then anaphylactic shock is a type of distributive shock because what's released? It's histamines. Histamines. And they cause for the, uh, for the vessels to dilate. And then you've got uh, low fluid volume, which is hypovolemic shock. Now, there's a difference in just hypovolemic shock and hemorrhagic shock. And what is that? All right. So, no, that's going to be on distributive types of shock. I'm just talking about hypovolemic and hemorrhagic. So hypovolemic is an umbrella term, and hemorrhagic sh uh, shock does fall under hypovolemic. All right, but I can I can become hypovolemic without ever shedding a drop of blood. Right? I can vomit, or have diarrhea, or be out in the heat all day long and lose a lot of fluids, and I be can become hypovolemic. All right. Where the hemorrhagic portion comes in is when you start losing blood volume, losing oxygen carrying capacity. All right, and so the pathology or pathophysiology is the same, other than with hypovolemic shock, you haven't lost blood per se, but you've lost fluid, and so you're not going to have as much fluid in the vasculature. All right, and then with hemorrhagic, you're losing blood, you're losing oxygen carrying capacity, all right? Um, I mean, hemorrhagic shock is going to be due to any type of injury that causes bleeding, right? We don't need a whole slide dedicated to that. It's going to be to any, anything that causes bleeding. You've got your compensated, decompensated, and irreversible shock. Your compensated shock, that's going to be your early stages. And it's going to relate directly to the amount of volume or the amount of fluid that's been lost. Class 1 is usually going to be about 3 quarters of a liter. Class 2 is going to be 3 quarters of a liter to about a liter and a half. And then on up. So anything greater than 2 liters is going to be class 4 shock. Class 4 is going to be the worst stage of shock, right? Irreversible shock. They don't call it irreversible for no reason, right? It's irreversible because in the field especially, there's nothing we can really do because it all goes back to the fact that they've lost the oxygen carrying capacity. They've lost two liters of blood. They've lost a lot of blood, so they've lost that oxygen carrying capacity. We can fill them back up with two liters of fluid, 
but all we're doing is just diluting their system down even more. All right. So in your class one, your pressure is going to be the same. Um, respiratory rate is going to be in normal range. And heart rate, now here's the thing about heart rate. Resting heart rate, my resting heart rate may be 68, 70. All right? So if I'm in stage one shot, my heart rate may go up to 88 or 90 just to increase perfusion, right? To increase stroke volume and cardiac output. But I'm not, by definition, tachycardic, right? So it's not always going to be textbook tachycardia that you see. So you've got to look at your other signs and symptoms too. That patient that just, it, some just don't seem right with them. They're just, they're, they're a little bit agitated. They're a little bit just anxious. Um, then fluid replacement, usually you can um, deliver an isotonic crystalloid for class one and class two and then the body is going to pick up and, and resume production, all right, if we can get the bleeding stopped. Now once we get to class three and class four, then we're having to get crystalloid solutions and we're having to get blood. And the whole purpose of getting red blood cells is going to be what? Oxygen carrying capacity, all right? We've talked about that pretty good. We looked at um, compensa uh, compensated and decompensated. One of the big things that's going to tell you that your, par your partner, your patient is, is doing terrible. Yeah, if your partner starts having altered mental status, you may need to request a new one. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the big things that's going to tell you that your patient is progressively getting worse is the fact that they were sitting here talking to us, they were restless, but they were talking to us, and now they're getting to the point to where they're unresponsive. That's how you know that their brain ain't getting perfusion, right? Sense of impending doom. Yeah, you're doomed. If we don't get you to the hospital, it ain't impending, it's coming. <laughs> um, you got the weak rapid thready pulse incompensated. Why are we having the weak, thready pulse, the clammy skin? Why are we seeing all that and compensating? Shunting. Shunting. That's the, one of the big things that the body does to compensate, right? It, it does the peripheral shunting. It sends the blood from the extremities, the non-vital areas of the body, to the core. So we're not getting as much um, perfusion and blood to the uh, non-vital parts of the body. Um, and then, of course, all the other things that just are bad. Diminished urine output, impending cardiac arrest. Now, you've got a patient that was compensated. They've, went, they've become decompensated. They go to cardiac arrest. Do we work it? Yeah, of course you do. I mean, that patient was doing fine. We're not doing fine, but they were relatively okay then they got worse. Of course you do. Now, if you arrived on scene and you could obviously see that this patient has exsanguinated and, and it's an obvious traumatic cardiac arrest with no viable signs of life, no, of course you don't work it, right? Um, findings in hemorrhagic shock. Some of these terms you're not going to be real familiar with. The pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. Um, your COCI, your cardiac output, cardiac index. I mean, we know what cardiac output is, but there's actually numbers that they can measure. When you, when I used to work in ICU, when you came to us, we would put in a Swans-Gans catheter in, and we would measure your pulmonary pressures. We would measure your uh, cardiac output, your cardiac index, and all that kind of stuff. All right. Scene size up. Y'all know what to do, right? You know what to do. You know significant mechanisms of injury. We've talked about that. Immediate life threats, very important. We've got to manage those immediate life threats. My rule of thumb is, how do I determine if I'm going to manage an injury or not? Is it going to kill them in the next three to five minutes, right? If that injury is not going to kill them in the next three to five minutes, then I'm moving on and stabilizing. If that injury is going to kill them in the next three to five minutes, I'm focusing attention on them. Case in point, tension pneumothorax, all right? 
that could kill them in the next 35 minutes. It's inhibiting oxygen, um, oxygenation. Any of your respiratory injuries, significant respiratory injuries, you need to manage. That is a life threat. Any major bleeding, that is a life threat. It has to be managed. Um, dull eyes, altered level of consciousness, all the things that you would see in shop because it um, is, is shop. Even if it's an internal hemorrhage, um, it's still going to be shop because the blood's inside the body, but it's not in a container that can use it. If minor external hemorrhage, put pressure. Direct pressure, right? If internal hemorrhage, get them to the hospital quickly, because even if it's minor, you don't know that, right? How would you even know if that patient's having minor internal hemorrhage? You probably would. All right? You don't need a break? I don't know. We are? 48 to 75. 48 to 75. What are you getting close to? Have y'all heard how much I talk? Go through the summary, Steve. I need to take a break. We're taking a break. All right, so the next couple things history taking, secondary assessment, vital signs, all the stuff that we just talked about, and it's probably going to be the same stuff that you'll see in each subsequent chapter. Um, you know, the biggest thing that it comes down to when you're doing a traumatic assessment, a trauma assessment, is you've got a lot more that you've got to look at overall than just a generalized illness or general weakness or, you know, even a cardiac patient. I mean, you can perform more of a focused assessment on a medical patient. But when, when it comes to trauma, you've got a lot of things that you need to look at. You know, when you do your, your, your check-offs, when you did your advanced EMT check-off and your EMT check-offs and all that, you mentioned, I'm going to check, I'm going to identify mechanism of injury. The mechanism of injury was a car wreck. Yeah, the car wreck cause was the overall cause of the injury. All right? If the car wreck wouldn't have happened, then they wouldn't have had that injury, right? But the wreck itself is not the mechanism of injury. The event of the wreck itself is not the mechanism of injury. The mechanism of injury is what? The energy and forces that acted against the body, right? So I'm not saying that you've got to identify the G-forces and all that stuff when you do your assessments and all that for class. But if you work enough car wrecks, you start to kind of get these, these patterns developed in your mind of what to look for, right? And you kind of get a better understanding of this type of accident occurred, so I'm expecting these kinds of injuries, okay? I was trying to think of this term the whole morning long, and I finally thought about it. What is a pertinent negative? It should be there, not there. Right, something that should be there or something that you expect but isn't. Why is that important to identify? Kind of a twofold thing. It's important to identify because, number one, it proves that you're a competent medic and you assess for that situation. You assess for that injury. You knew what to look for. Number two, if they start to develop these signs and symptoms later on, that's going to help continuation of care. That's going to help the, the receiving facility to identify that this patient is progressing, this patient's getting worse, right? It's very important to give a full account of a traumatic scene. It's very important to look at all the factors involved, all right? Um, and then moving past that, when you're doing your assessment, when you've got just a plain medical situation that you've identified chest pain or difficulty breathing, you can isolate that, right? You can't isolate anything in trauma until you've done a full assessment, all right? And now there is a difference in a rapid assessment 
and a full secondary assessment, right? What is the purpose of your rapid assessment? Immediate life threats. Do you do a rapid assessment in the field? Yes, you may not get on your hands and knees and call out, I'm checking your JVD, I'm checking your tracheal deviation. You may not do that, but as soon as I lay eyes on my patient, I'm doing a full body scan, right? And I do it the same way every time. And I hope those of you that are working do it the same way every time. When I start, I go up to my patient, I, my hand just muscle memory grabs their radial wrist or their radial artery. <laughs> you know, that's the best thing right there. <laughs> Tell me bad. Um, you know, I start checking a pulse, and I start at their head, and I look up and down, right? Because if I start at their head, I'm assessing airway, but I'm also assessing injury, right? I'm moving on down. I'm assessing their chest, all right? I've checked my pulse. I've noticed there's not a good pulse. I'm hoping my partner's getting the rest of my vital signs. I'm putting my hands on my patient. I think that you guys are far enough along now to where y'all don't really have any issue with that. Those of you that want to do clinicals at Lanier, just remind me to tell you all about this. Um, anyways, y'all are far, far enough along in, number one, you're already um, pre-hospital professionals. You've all got your advanced EMT license, all right? So you're already licensed professionals. And number two, you're far enough along in your education to realize that you don't take care of a patient without putting your hands on them, all right? in whatever spot of their body that you need to put your hands on them. Especially in trauma, all right? Especially in trauma. Now, that's not a good excuse or anything else, Ron, but especially <laughs> <laughs> I heard you giggle. Uh, but especially... Hey, I'm, I'm all about a 12 lead on a 14-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> oh, wow. well, it's recorded. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> let's move on. Look for your signs of internal hemorrhage. Oh, man. I'm looking for your ABCs. Important. Moving on. Important. Your cardiac monitoring is going to be very, very important in these um, um, what's the word I'm trying to look for? Multi-system trauma. <laughs> Ryan's just got me off kill. <laughs> Multi-system trauma, severe trauma, your cardiac monitoring is going to be very important. Because hypovolemic shock or hemorrhagic shock not only does the lack of oxygen affect body cells, just generalized tissue cells, but lack of oxygen affects heart cells too, right? And of those four characteristics of a cardiac cell, irritability being one of them, heart cells get very irritated when they don't get oxygen, right? So not only are we looking at a person that's in hypovolemic shock and they've got that going against them, but now they're losing electrolytes and we know that the heart, it functions off of electrolytes, right? The heart functions off of oxygenation. So now we're looking at arrhythmias and it's a whole unique situation, all right? We treat a patient in cardiac arrest that is because of a diseased heart with ACLS, right? How do you how do you treat a patient that's in a traumatic cardiac arrest? You're gonna treat them with ACLS. 
But the difference is that we can give that patient all the antidysrhythmics in the world, all right? And we can compress that heart all we want to. But until we can start getting electrolytes and oxygen back into them, that heart is going to stay irritated, right? That heart is still going to stay unstable. And then, of course, we your cardiovascular system, we're checking our pulses, our radial wrists, and cap refill time. Cap refill time, not a great indicator in adults, right? More in children less than five years old. Neurosystem. What's the main thing we're looking for with neuro? We're looking for what? Alter mental status. We're looking for mental status. All right? But now, part of your PMS is part of your neurologic as well, right? We're checking for distal function, motor, and sensory, right? Then, of course, our musculoskeletal. And we've got to assess all the anatomic regions. All of them. All right? Now, we don't have to spend time on all of them, but we do need to scan, right? Once we've done a full body scan, then we can isolate, all right? Then reassess, five minutes if they're critical, 15 non-critical. Um, what is the point in standard precautions? Why do we have standard precautions? To protect ourselves, all right? But we use standard precautions so that we can treat every patient the same regardless of whether they've got an infectious disease or not, right? If I'm using proper standard precautions, I can take care of that patient with HIV the same as I can take care of that patient that doesn't have HIV, right? Because bottom line is, I don't care whether you've got a disease or not, I don't want your blood on me. I don't want your body fluids on me, so I'm going to do everything I can to keep that from happening, right? Yes. Um, bleeding from the nose, ears, and mouth. What do we need to um, check for if we, especially in multi-system trauma, if we have bleeding from the nose, ears? Yeah, we're looking for the halo. Um, we're... Uh, <laughs> We're going to take a gauze and let that blood drip on it, and then we're going to see if that halo is around it. All right? Do we pack the ears and the nose and all that? No, of course not. Um, we just will um, cover the bleeding site just loosely. Um, you know, if it's just a, uh, a, a nosebleed that occurred, you know, they've got those nose tampons that they can shove up in there and inflate them. Yeah, it's a balloon. It's you show it up and it inflates with air and it should watch it. I don't know. I'll back into the I mean if you want to Google it at home, I'm not about to do that here because there's no telling what will come up. <laughs> um, apply cold compress then just I mean pretty much hemorrhaging is hemorrhaging you've got to find a way to stop the bleeding right it don't matter where it is you've got to find a way to stop the bleeding um, now you'll get into special considerations for hemorrhaging and stuff like that when you get into special populations, when you get into obstetric and gynecological emergencies and things like that, you know, and then you take a little bit different approach. Um, but as far as traumatic hemorrhaging, anything that we pack or anything that we cover, it needs to be sterile, right? We need to use sterile dressings. Um, because we don't want to contaminate it anymore. If it is a nasty, just road rash full of asphalt and all that, we even need to consider rinsing it out with some sterile water as well. Um, keep the patient warm, all right, because you start losing your thermoregulatory mechanisms whenever you start going into shop. And your patient's condition should indicate the mode of transport, what we've talked about this whole time. Tourniquets. Yeah. You're bad if you're putting your own tourniquet on. 
That's some of that Marky Mark bunch right there. Um, well, your tourniquet is just crazy to me about this whole tourniquet thing. Um, not the use of the tourniquet, but just the fact that when I graduated in 2005, if you put a tourniquet on, then you were going to fail. I mean, if you considered using a tourniquet, you would fail. And I came back to help start teaching adjunct in 2010, and these jokers were wanting to throw tourniquets on. I was like, yo, retard, you can't put tourniquets on. And they turned it around and said, no, you're dumb because you don't know. And so <laughs> tourniquets are just, um, you know, it's, it's that thing that how healthcare just runs that full circle, right? I mean, they started with the military, then over time they realized the past 10, 14, 10 12 years, you know, we've been overseas in wars, and they've realized that, hey, tourniquets may not be all that bad, you know. Uh, the biggest thing that you've got to worry about with application of a tourniquet is going to be what? All right, time, very important. If we place a tourniquet on, that is grounds for rapid transport, right? Because if that bleeds bad enough that we've got uh, to put a tourniquet on, they're going to need surgery, right? <coughs> um, also, once you apply that tourniquet, you can't take it off because you've cut off blood circulation. So you've made that area distal to that tourniquet hypoxic, right? It's going to become hypoxic. It's going to become toxic. What happens if you release that tourniquet? Yeah, it's going to go back into the circulatory system. All right? Blood pressure cuffs can be used anything that you can, you know, tie off. Um, don't put it over a joint. Never use narrow material. Why? Yeah, it's going to cut into the tissues. Use wide padding underneath, and then have you a sharpie and write the time that you put a tourniquet across their forehead. I do that when I get meds. Yeah. Chris does this, yeah. He'll write whenever, wherever the IV site is, he'll write on there what he gave. Yeah. Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> right on the nose. Frequent flyer. <laughs> um, you want to make sure that your, your tourniquet is in view and that the hospital knows that they have it. All right. Splinting. What can we say about splinting? You know what to do, right? You've got your, you've got your different types of splints. Um, as far as like splinting and controlling bleeding, you've got your air splints. They can control bleeding because they put pressure. Your rigid splints, your traction splints. I don't really think we need to go into this, do we? Are y'all comfortable with splinting? Yes. Your hemostatic agents. Um, there's two different forms of your hemostatic agents. You can get the powder form where you just dump it in, or then you can get the impregnated dressings. Um, they work. They work. They work real well. The problem is, is that once you put that on, it's going to form that clot in with the hemostatic agent. So if you pull that thing off, it's going to open that wound back up. So once you put a hemostatic agent on, you let the surgeon worry about taking it off and all that. Um, managing of internal hemorrhage um, is going to be the same as managing any other hemorrhage. Um, you've just got to be a little bit more alert and attentive to notice it. All right. Um, management of shock. That's what we've been talking about this whole time. Everything that we've just talked about right there. All right. Um, all right. Are there any questions?